The next time you cook in your kitchen, imagine the cosmos with stars acting as the celestial kitchens that cook up the elements that make up our universe. At the core of these nuclear pressure cookers, temperatures and pressures are so high that they provide the perfect conditions for nuclear fusion. The process that powers the stars and gives birth to the elements we know. It all starts with hydrogen, the lightest element, which fuses to form helium, which then fuses to create carbon, oxygen and progressively heavier elements. This continues until the star's core reaches high enough temperatures and pressures to fuse silicon and sulfur, ultimately forming iron. And at this point, we have a problem. Iron is the last element that can be produced through nuclear fusion in a typical star. Once the core of a star is mostly iron, the fusion process grinds to a halt. Iron has an incredibly stable nuclear configuration and fusing iron nuclei together consumes more energy than it releases. Remember, E is equal to mc squared, therefore making fusion unviable. Iron therefore sets the stage for a dramatic climax. Massive stars that have consumed their nuclear fuel and accumulated an iron core eventually collapse under their own immense gravitational force leading to a spectacular supernova explosion. It is during these cataclysmic events that all elements heavier than iron, everything from gold to silver to copper to uranium are made. So the next time you look at your cast iron vessel, remember this. It was born in the heart of a star. But the cosmic irony is iron signals the death of a star. But it is crucial to life on Earth. This is because iron plays a vital role in the chemistry of life, particularly in the transport and storage of oxygen within living organisms. This is possible because iron is unique in its ability to form compounds with oxygen. You see, oxygen, while being essential to life, is also deadly because in free form, it will oxidize a lot of the critical machinery in your body. This is why life uses iron to safely store and transport oxygen. At the heart of this process is the heme molecule, a complex structure composed of iron and a ring-like organic compound called porphyrin. Fun fact, the porphyrin ring is remarkably common in all life. Plants use the exact same structure except with magnesium instead of iron to make chlorophyll. Back to heme, it is the key component of hemoglobin, a protein found in red blood cells that transports oxygen from lungs to our tissues. The iron atom in the heme molecule can exist in two different oxidation states, ferrous and ferric. You probably remember this from chemistry in school. The ability to gain or lose an electron allows iron to bind and release oxygen molecules with remarkable efficiency. When hemoglobin in your blood encounters oxygen-rich environments such as the lungs, the iron atoms in the heme molecules switch to the ferrous state and bind to oxygen molecules. This oxygen-bound form of hemoglobin is then transported throughout the body via blood. As the hemoglobin reaches a place where oxygen is needed, the iron atoms release the oxygen molecules, switching back to the ferric state. The released oxygen is then used by cells for various metabolic processes such as burning glucose to generate energy. This elegant chemical dance between iron and oxygen is essential for the survival of animals like us. So the next time you take a deep breath, remember that it's iron atoms from the cores of stars in your blood that make it possible for oxygen to reach every corner of your body.
if you do not have enough iron in your blood, you will feel fatigued, weak, develop memory problems and have pale skin. So iron is pretty important in your diet. Which brings us to iron in food. Iron exists in two main forms, heme and non-heme. But here is a more intuitive way to understand this difference. Animals move, they walk, run and fly. Plants don't. Animals therefore have a very high metabolic rate, meaning they need to produce a lot more energy and thus need a lot of oxygen in every part of their bodies to burn fuel, which comes from food. Plants, on the other hand, have a very low metabolic rate. This is why trees live thousands of years. They're not in any hurry. So plants do not need a circulatory system that carries oxygen like animals do with blood. They absorb oxygen directly from the air and it moves through the plant through passive diffusion. And here is the fascinating thing. This is why plants produce a lot of antioxidants to prevent damage from oxygen. These are molecules which are actually very beneficial to our health. And heme-based iron, like what we have in our blood, is actually dangerous for plants. And that is why they produce molecules that lock up iron and prevent it from doing damage. An example is phytates. And this is why foods like dals and spinach, despite containing iron, do not let your body absorb it well. Always remember, plants have no interest in feeding you iron. They have an interest in preventing iron from damaging them when they were alive. So heme iron is found primarily in animal-based foods, such as red meat, poultry, and fish. It is the form of iron that is bound to the heme molecule, which is a component of hemoglobin, which is in blood, and myoglobin in muscles. Heme iron is highly bioavailable, meaning it is readily absorbed and utilized by the body. Our body uses heme iron to transport oxygen. So it absorbs heme iron from meat much better. On the other hand, non-heme iron is found in plant-based foods, such as legumes, dals, grains, and nuts. This form of iron is not bound to the heme molecule and is generally less bioavailable than heme iron. And Indian diets are very heavy in dals and grains. Dals have phytates, as I told you before, and that will inhibit iron absorption. Other plant-based foods have polyphenols, which are excellent for your health, but they will also get in the way of iron absorption. One thing that helps is vitamin C, which actually improves the absorption of non-heme iron. Many iron supplements in India contain non-heme iron, often in the form of ferrous sulfate or ferrous gluconate. This is because red dot, green dot. Heme iron has to come from animal sources. So those supplements will technically be non-veg. So most supplements in India are poorly absorbed by our bodies. Or as one doctor put it, it's just expensive urine. So go read the label on your iron supplements. There is a good chance that it is likely non-heme. This is also why rich vegetarians in India will quietly buy iron supplements from abroad because there is no red dot there. So don't ask, don't tell. But let me tell you, effective iron supplements are made from cow or pig's blood outside India. This is often the tension between culture and medical science. Both Hindus and Muslims will have a problem with iron supplements from abroad. What option do you have? Look out for red dot supplements made in India. They tend to be made from chicken blood. So vegetarians in India are particularly at a higher risk of developing iron deficiency, anemia, than people who eat meat. A study conducted in Gujarat found that the prevalence of anemia was significantly higher among vegetarians, 66.2%, compared to meat eaters, 44.6%. And that high rate, even among meat eaters, 
is because most Indians do not really consume a lot of meat on average. Most of everyone's diets in India is plant-based. So why does this happen? One, vegetarians do not consume heme iron found in animal-based foods, which is more readily absorbed by the body compared to non-heme iron found in plant-based foods. Two, the Indian diet, both vegetarian and meat-based, is very high in grains, dals and vegetables. And those are rich in phytates, oxalates and polyphenols, all of which are healthy but inhibit the absorption of non-heme iron. Three, many people do not consume enough vitamin C in their diet. This can significantly improve iron absorption. So what should you do? Let's hear from a nutritionist, Amita Gadre. A lot of times people consume iron-rich foods like methi thepla or chiuda with nuts along with tea. Tea contains tannins and oxalates, both of which bind with non-heme iron. Coffee is no different. It contains chlorogenic acid, which is a potent inhibitor of non-heme iron. Other overlooked dietary habits include consumption of calcium-rich foods like dahi or milk with iron-rich foods, or even eating antacids with or before consuming any food, especially iron-rich food. So what to do? Preventing iron deficiency anemia involves adopting a well-balanced diet rich in iron-containing foods and ensuring optimal absorption of iron in the body. First, get yourself tested. A complete blood count or CBC, serum ferritin or a TIBC test will tell you if you are anemic. If you eat meat, consider occasionally eating liver, kidney or other organ meat. These organ meats tend to be 5 to 6 times richer than the other cuts of the meat. If you don't prefer eating organ meat, at the very least, increase your consumption of lean meat like chicken and eggs to at least 5 times per week. If you are vegetarian, eat iron rich foods like dal and spinach but pair them with vitamin C rich foods like chilies, capsicum, tomatoes and lime juice. Don't worry about the phytic acid. Cooking ensures that 80% of the phytic acid in dals and pulses drops. So you should be including dals and pulses in your diet as well because they do contain the iron. Instead of worrying about the inhibitors like phytic acids, all you need to do is eat those same foods in its cooked form. For example, a spinach dal with red rice or a bajra and methi thepla are great choices. If you're anemic, consider avoiding tea and coffee completely and don't be taking your calcium supplements along with your iron supplements. If you must have tea or coffee, you can have it after a gap of 30 minutes. Consider adding iron-rich plant-based sources like moringa, wheatgrass, spirulina, nori, black sesame seeds, flax seeds powder to your diet. Remember, every little bit of iron counts and these sources are going to be more useful than drinking copious amounts of beetroot juice or like you know, stuffing yourself with poha. Those two don't have as much iron. This might seem very trivial, but cooking in cast iron cookware can also add a small amount of iron to your diet. But remember, it's non-heme, so don't assume that it's going to make a big difference, but still, like I said, every bit counts. Make sure that your protein intake is up to the mark. The iron in our body is transported, absorbed and stored bound to a protein. If your protein intake is poor, you will not have enough carriers or storehouses which is ferritin for iron in your body. If you have been prescribed an iron supplement, you should take it before a meal. That is when the iron absorption happens the most. For some people, taking an iron supplement before a meal can give a little bit of nausea. In that scenario, you can take that iron supplement along with a little bit of food but remember to take it right up at the beginning. Iron supplements also tend to induce constipation or black stool or even metallic taste for some people. In such scenarios, if you can, it's always best to switch to a heme iron supplement. We do now thankfully get some chicken blood based heme iron supplements in India. Ask your doctor or nutritionist for a prescription for the same. To avoid iron supplement induced constipation, increase your water and dietary fiber intake. Bonus, 
a lot of plant based iron rich foods also are good sources of fiber isn't that a win win instead of taking an iron supplement every day consider taking it on alternate days when we take an oral iron supplement our serum hepcidin levels go up which can prevent optimal iron absorption levels Taking it alternate day ensures better fractional iron absorption. It is a good idea to take your oral iron supplement with some lemon water or nimbu pani or orange juice. That little vitamin C will go a long way in improving your total iron levels. Number 6, overdoing it. Too much iron is also not required. While iron is essential for our health, it is important to remember that too much of a good thing can also be harmful. Excessive iron intake can lead to a condition called secondary iron overload or acquired hemochromatosis, which can adversely impact your heart, liver, spleen and other organs. People, especially postmenopausal women, who have been taking iron supplements for better health for a really long time are at the most risk of an iron overload like any supplement even iron supplementation should be done only in case of a deficiency and under medical supervision only a lot of times over the counter harmless looking supplements like multivitamins tonics protein supplements specialized health foods can also be iron fortified Trending now is an intravenous infusion of iron and multivitamin cocktail which are often taken for general health hair and skin benefits these two taken over a long term can prove to be harmful especially when there's no established deficiency the best way is to get your iron levels checked through a blood test and supplement only if needed so in summary get yourself tested If you are anemic, fix your diet to include more iron-rich foods like liver and kidney. And if you are vegetarian, more dal's, spinach, and dark-colored vegetables. Remember, if it's white or pale in color, it will not have iron. Don't let the element that signals the death of a star slow down your life.